Good morning, everyone. It is really good to be with you again today. Thank you for taking the time to worship and to and to learn together, even if we're doing it online. It is so good to be together and, and to do this. Thank you for choosing to do it today. Let's pray as we consider the words from God that we've heard. Father God, thank you that you know us and you love us. Thank you for that promise that you are always with us. As we consider your word today, please speak to our hearts. Please speak to us the words that we need to know from you today in order to live well, even in the midst of trouble. Give us grace, Lord, the grace that we need to live safely and securely in you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, on the news, um, interspersed with uh, lots of detail about the the crisis that's going on, um, there have been some snippets about uh, mental health and how um, to look after ourselves mentally as well as physically. Um, And a lot of it is good, helpful advice, which is sensible to follow and, uh, and, and, and to benefit from. But it strikes me time and again that however good the advice is, something's missing. It ignores the reality of God. It seems that um, in the advice that we get unquestioningly, unthinkingly perhaps, God is ruled out of considerations, not considered part of the solution. And that saddens me, to be honest, because when life gets difficult, we need to know about the reality of God. We need to know the full picture of reality. And today's reading, uh, Psalm 91, is a very powerful reading indeed. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Those are wonderful words of power and love, and balanced, sound thinking, good mental health, if you like. They're not about fear and anxiety, they're about security, those key words, shelter, shadow, a refuge, a fortress. Those words tell us that we can trust God in the tough times. And it goes on, verse 3, He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. A fowler is someone who lays down a trap to catch an animal or even a human being. The deadly pestilence is a fatal sickness or disease. And right now, of course, we know more about fatal sickness and disease than ever we wanted to. And that's why these words are important. So often the Bible speaks right into our situation, right into the heart of human life and human suffering. And what God is trying to do in this psalm is to comfort us and reassure us right in the middle of all our worries. Verse 4, he will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. God's got you covered. It's like, imagine a, a ginormous eagle that swoops down and picks you up and flies off with you, carrying you to a safe place. That's what that verse, the image, the idea of that verse is. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler, it goes on. That says God is trustworthy and God will defend us in big ways and small ways, just like the big shields and the little shields people used to have and use in battle. God's like a protective shield that the enemy can't get past. And the psalm goes on reassuring us over and over that we don't have to worry And it names some of the calamities that do cause us to worry and do give us anxiety. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Big things there. Terrorism, warfare, sickness, destruction. You will not fear them, is what this psalm says to us very confidently. It does sound like a psalm written for wartime in many ways. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but you, it will not come near. Even as things come crashing down around us, all that we've been used to, all that we've relied on, 
we're going to be safe and secure in God. That's an astonishing, it's a wonderful promise. And the whole of the psalm is just like that, profoundly reassuring in profoundly difficult times. Um, it's interesting, I think, that the psalm uses war words, if you like, that it speaks to some of the worst times of, of human history. I used to live in the Netherlands in a place called Nijmegen in the east of the Netherlands. It was very close to a, another city called Arnhem. And in World War II, Arnhem was the location of a, a notable and, and very tragic battle. In 1944, uh, the liberation of Europe from the Nazis was underway and Allied forces were in the process of retaking occupied land. But the whole thing stalled when they tried to cross the River Rhine and the bridges at Arnhem and Nijmegen. And a huge effort went in to this battle. The parachute regiment parachuted in many men and in an effort to keep the liberation going. But they were driven back. There were huge numbers of casualties. And Arnhem, in particular, suffered terrible destruction. And you can read about that episode in history in many places, of course. But probably the most well-known account is has its basis in a book called A Bridge Too Far, um, by Cornelius Ryan. It was also made into a film. And I can remember watching that film after I'd lived in Nijmegen. And that was the first time I'd seen the film. And Robert Redford was in the boat paddling across with many others, paddling across the river at Nijmegen. And um, tr they were trying to recapture the bridge. Um, he was under fire and he was praying every inch of the way. But he and a lot of his colleagues got over and they took the bridge at Nijmegen from both ends. The bridge was saved, Nijmegen was saved. But it was all in vain because just a few miles away in Arnhem, there weren't enough resources to hold out against the Nazi forces. And it got to the point where the hospitals in Arnhem were just full to overflowing of wounded people and dying soldiers. And the, the situation was so bad that a temporary hospital was set up in a house just on the outskirts of Arnhem. And the person who owned the house was a lady called Kate Terhorst, and she not only let her house become this temporary hospital, she also went round the house and tried to bring strength and comfort to the wounded and the dying who were there. And in his book, Cornelius Ryan says that each night, going from room to room, she prayed with the wounded and read to them from the 91st Psalm, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. And in the film, there is one scene where a badly wounded soldier asks to take her hand and she reads to him, he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions. Under his wings, you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. And as she reads those words to him, we see him very gently passing away. It's a very touching, a very moving scene. And later, after the war, Kate Horst was uh, honoured for all that she did. But seeing that scene raised questions in my mind. And it's the sort of question that plagues us even more when we're in difficult times. When fear and anxiety have taken hold of us, sometimes these big doubts rise up in us. There was terrorism, there was warfare, there was sickness, there was destruction. But there appeared to be no security and no safety and no deliverance for thousands and even tens of thousands of people. And that was true at the Battle of Arnhem, where many died. And of course it's true again now, as we come to terms with the cost of the virus outbreak, in which many are dying in an untimely way. So the difficult question that comes... And it's a question which fear and anxiety in us will magnify. Are these just nice religious words that actually mean nothing in our troubles? Do they mean nothing as we face up, as we're forced to face up to the reality of, not just of inconvenience in our daily lives, but of real suffering and death? When we go to the New Testament, you see 
time and time again that Jesus had a weird attitude to death. Jesus had a weird attitude to death. He didn't deal with death in the same way that we would or that everyone else around him in those days did. Jesus had a weird attitude to death. And there are plenty of stories and plenty of things that Jesus said to illustrate it. There's, there's one story when um, someone's daughter was seriously ill uh, and her father came to Jesus to, to say, come and lay your hands on her. We need her to get well. But at that moment, Jesus was, as he often was, surrounded by a crowd of people following him and wanting things from him. And one woman reached out and touched him and she was instantly healed. And Jesus knew power had gone out from him. And he asked who had touched him and the woman said it was her. And Jesus blessed her and told her to go in peace. There was a lot going on when this man came up to Jesus. And that man was probably standing watching this crowd full of fear and anxiety. It was a life and death situation for him. But Jesus just carried on dealing with the crowd in front of him. You'd think Jesus would say, OK, stop everything. I've got to go and help this man and his daughter. She's dying. But he doesn't. He just carries on dealing with the crowd. And as he was speaking to the woman and the crowd around him, some of the man's friends came up and said to him, look, don't bother Jesus anymore. Your daughter's died. The crowd was still there, still around Jesus at that point. Maybe he overheard, or maybe he just knew what had happened. And he said to the man, don't be afraid. Just believe she's going to be fine. And then he took a few of his disciples with him. He went to the man's house. And when they got there, there was weeping and mourning already in full swing. And Jesus then said, what must have struck those people there as ridiculous, as offensive, or very possibly both. With all the people mourning and grieving, weirdly, Jesus said this. He said, why are you making a fuss? This child isn't dead. She's sleeping. What a weird thing to say at such a moment. And the account, you can see it in Mark 5 and Luke 8, the account says that people laughed at Jesus. Well, people laugh at Jesus now. They laughed at Jesus then. But Jesus took no notice at all. He went to the girl with her father and mother and he said to her, little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl got up and started walking around. What an amazing story. There was another story when Jesus interrupted a funeral procession. Can you imagine that? Um, in all the funerals that I take, one of the little fears at the back of your mind is someone will do something crazy. Um, just the thought of anyone breaking in on a funeral procession would strike anyone as bad taste or offensive or worse. But that's exactly what Jesus did. A man had died. This man was his widowed mother's only son. She needed him in order to exist herself but he died and was being buried and of course she was she was weeping and when Jesus saw her he had compassion for her and what happened next was again astonishing and weird first of all he said to the woman don't cry and then he stopped the funeral procession that was going by he walked up to the bearers and to the coffin and he said young man I say to you get up can you imagine the tension in that moment if you were in the crowd watching that unfold? What is this man doing? Doesn't he understand it's a funeral? How weird is this? But those words Jesus spoke were words of life. And once again, when Jesus spoke his words of life, the man got up and started talking. And Jesus, the accounts say, gave him back to his mother. Jesus had a very weird attitude to death. There was another occasion when Jesus seemed quite deliberately to stay away as one of his best friends passed away when one of his best friends died. Can you imagine that? If it's one of the closest friends or family members you have, it, it, if they're dying and you didn't turn up at all, and then you didn't turn up for the for the funeral. You turned up late at the funeral, not just by a few minutes, not just by a few hours, but actually you didn't turn up to the funeral for four days. How weird would that be? 
But that's exactly what Jesus did when his best friend died. His best friend was called Lazarus. And when he did finally show up at the family home, Lazarus's sister, Martha, challenged him and she didn't hold back. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus's response in John's account is fascinating. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And he said, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he's going to live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And he said, do you believe this to Martha? Jesus actually was not unmoved by or insensitive to the grief and the mourning of Lazarus's family and friends. You may well know what the shortest sentence in the Bible is. You may not know that this was the context in which that shortest sentence in the Bible occurred. When he was faced with the reality of the tears and suffering of Lazarus's family and friends, the Bible says, Jesus wept. And those two little words reveal so much about Jesus, the Son of God, his motivation, his compassion, his purpose, his love. He cares about ordinary people like us in our grief and in our fear and in our anxiety and in our loss. And what Jesus did then was to tell them to take away the gravestone. Lazarus had been buried in a tomb. The stone had been put across the tomb and Jesus told them to take it away. And when they had done that, he shouted, Lazarus, come out. And then Lazarus, the man who had died four days earlier, came out, his hands and his feet, the account says, still bound with the linen strips he'd been buried in and his face wrapped in a cloth. What a sight. What a weird attitude to death Jesus had. But he also seemed to be in control of it. This week we remember that Jesus died and rose it's holy week and i encourage you to take part in all the activities going on um online and in other ways in, at home and uh, please take a full part enter into the time when we remember how jesus died and rose um today is palm sunday um, and we're remembering how jesus entered into jerusalem in triumph one minute the crowds were cheering and waving their flags uh, welcoming jesus like a king but as the week went on things changed and before long, Jesus was condemned to death and brutally nailed to a cross and left to die. And even on the cross, Jesus' attitude to death was weird. Like that soldier in Kate Tohorst's house, the thief who was crucified next to him and was dying asked for help and reassurance. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, he said. And Jesus' response was amazing. Thinking about it, I'd say Jesus could have recited Psalm 91 to this man, just like Kate Horst did. Read it again later when you've got time and you just imagine that context, Jesus saying it lovingly to him and imagine him saying it to you as well. He could have read out Psalm 91, recited it word for word perhaps, but what Jesus did say was short and sweet and very much to the point. Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Isn't that strange? A conversation between two men in the process of being tortured to death turns on the idea that paradise awaits them both. Their bodies and souls are being ripped apart. And yet the implication is that Jesus and this man would very shortly be together in an amazing spiritual resting place. Meanwhile, his family and friends were shocked and grief-stricken at what was happening. The men ran away for fear of their own lives. Only John stayed on and some of the amazingly loyal women that were with Jesus. They stayed to watch the unimaginable horror moving to its conclusion. The triumph they would, they had hoped for was turning into disaster in front of their eyes. And of course, the weird thing is that to Jesus, it wasn't a matter of triumph and disaster at all. He knew exactly 
what was going on. Time and again, he'd said to his friends and his followers, the Son of Man is going to be killed and put to death and three days later rise. Time and again, he said it. Time and again, they didn't get it. It was Jesus and his weird attitude to death again. But what we remember this week, what we remember this coming weekend, is exactly what happened, what Jesus planned and knew and was in control of. On day one, Good Friday, Jesus was crucified and he died. On day two, Jesus was dead and buried in his tomb. And on day three, Jesus was raised from the dead, his spirit restored to a whole new kind of physical human body. He was crucified, dead and buried. And on the third day, he rose again. It blew their minds and it changed them completely. And as they began to take hold of the enormity of what had happened to Jesus, they began to understand many of those things that had seemed weird to them. Chief among them was that Jesus' weird attitude to death actually turned out to be the new normal. They came to understand what we heard in our reading from 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 1.10. I wonder if those words struck you as they were read because they're just mind-blowingly phenomenal, wonderful. What it says is this. Our Saviour, Christ Jesus, abolished death and brought life and immortality to light. Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality. That is, to put it mildly, remarkable. And it explains what seems to us that weird attitude to death that Jesus had. Jesus seemed to us to have a a weird attitude to death. Actually, it was because Jesus was in the process of destroying death. It no longer had any sway or control over people. And that's why when Jesus says amazing statements like this, we can take them seriously. Whoever believes in me, Though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Truly, I say to you, Jesus says, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. What a remarkable, amazing thing to say, vindicated by Jesus himself, rising from the dead. If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Perhaps that's what happened to that man, Kate to host prayed with and as she said those words from Psalm 91 perhaps that's what happened just slipped away into that new spiritual reality not even realising that death had caught up with him that might sound weird but actually Jesus makes clear it's the reality these aren't meaningless religious words at all Jesus didn't have a weird attitude to death. He knows what we didn't, and quite often still don't. Jesus is the one who died. Jesus is the one who rose. Jesus is the one who's abolished death. He, above all others, should know. I wish many people in our anxious and fearful world knew about this. There is more good advice available now than ever, but... Can you imagine the effect on the nation's mental health if everyone knew the truth about the God revealed to us in Jesus? Can you imagine the effect on the nation's mental health if we could hear Jesus speaking the words of Psalm 91 or speaking many other words of comfort and encouragement to us for real? Can you imagine the effect on the nation's mental health if we could know that Jesus is with us right here and now and that in the life to come he'll be with us he'll give us a spiritual resting place first in paradise and then raise us up like he was raised he'll be with us forever death will be swallowed up in victory what a perspective on life it's what we need what we need to know And the truth is we can know this for ourselves, despite the fears and anxieties which creep up on us, despite all the trouble and difficulty that's befallen us and is going on around us. Those words are true 
and good, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him, because he knows my name. When he calls, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him. I will honour him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. I am rescue. Those are God's promises to us in life and in death no matter what our fears and anxieties are. The life, death and resurrection of Jesus give us every reason to think that those words are trustworthy and true. So, what are we going to do about this? I'm going to suggest an action plan. What I suggest we do this week, as we remember the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, is that we also... Let these words of Psalm 91 sink deeper into us. Uh, and one way to do that is to learn the psalm off by heart. Um, maybe this is new to you. Maybe you'll just start with learning a portion of it. I don't know, but if you can learn all of it, great. Maybe start from the end and work backwards day by day. Add earlier verses as the week goes on, and that means you'll be able to remember the whole thing from start to finish at some point. Now, it's important to say, I don't mean learning this to impress God or to impress me or to impress anyone else. It's not a test of memory where you get a gold star for finishing and brownie points from God or someone else. You will need a lot of patience with yourself as you try and memorize it. What this really is, is a chance to let our hearts and minds feed on something other than fear and anxiety. What I'm talking about is the kind of mem memorization which is like a combination of prayer and meditation and memory all at the same time. It's doing it quietly and letting the Spirit, letting the Holy Spirit work in us to speak the reality of the power and truth of these wonderful words. And if you set aside time every day to, to do this, as you do it, you can bring into conversation with Jesus fears and anxieties that are playing on your mind and maybe just begin to hear what he's saying back to you through the words of the psalm and in that quiet voice that Jesus sometimes speaks to us with. The words of this psalm are the promises of his heart to you and as you get in touch with the words, it will be easier to hear and believe and trust in Jesus as you get to know him better and fan into flame, as the reading says, the gift of his spirit and life in you. And also, if a weighty three-hour World War II film is your thing, you can check out A Bridge Too Far. Uh, there's a full version on YouTube. You can look at that as well. So, as we finish, and I challenge you to take these words to heart, uh, in the week ahead. Uh, we're going to pray together. Let's pray. To this end, Jesus died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Lord Jesus, thank you for the reality, the knowledge, that whatever happens, death is beaten, and you are alive forever and you have done what it takes to save and deliver us right here in this life and in the life to come as well. Lord Jesus, please meet with us as we engage, remembering and marking the events of Holy Week. And as we engage with your word, taking into our hearts and into our memories Psalm 91. Lord Jesus, as we get to know you better this week, Dispel our fears and build our trust. Amen. Thank you so much for listening through all that half an hour. My goodness. I'll put some resources on the website as well. And um, I hope you will get to know God better, get to know Jesus better this week. Bless you and see you on one way or another on Good Friday and Holy Saturday and Easter Sunday as well. Please take a full part. Um, God bless. See you soon. Bye for now.